would like to begin with a few lines from Savitri. Always we bear in us a magic key, concealed in life's hermetic envelope, a burning witness in the sanctuary regards through time and the blind walls of form. A timeless light is in his hidden eyes. He sees the secret things no words can speak and knows the goal of the unconscious world and the heart of the mystery of the journeying years. Alive in a dead rotating universe, we whirl not here upon a casual globe, abandoned to a task beyond our force. Even through the tangled anarchy called fate, and through the bitterness of death and fall, an outstretched hand is felt upon our lives. It is near us, in unnumbered bodies and births. In its unslackening grasp, it keeps for us safe the one inevitable supreme result no will can take away and no doom change. The crown of conscious immortality. I had so many things to tell you that I had to write them out so I wouldn't forget some of these very special moments with mother. This was a talk similar to the one I gave on February 14th last year in the Hall of Harmony. As mother had written to me th through Pavitra, she told me not to try and reconstruct my inner experiences, as she said it would bring about a deformation which would render them quite useless. So I can only say that 12 years after Sri Aurobindo left his body, in a very short period of time, I had his darshan twice, and mother confirmed it. And again on 9999. I had my first experience of the mystical at a very young age, perhaps five or six years old. My mother was dying and the doctors were unable to cure her of an extremely high fever. As there was nothing more they could do, and they had given up on her, her brothers decided to bring a monk who had lived on Athos to our home in a small town in New Jersey in the US. His name was Father Afanasi. He was a healer. I remember his black robes none too clean, and his tall yet humble presence. He entered the room where all of us were standing around my mother's bed. He said nothing, but held a small dish of holy water in his left hand. With his right hand, he threw the water three times on my mother's face, and almost instantly she got out of bed, said she was fine, and went into the kitchen to prepare food for the family. My father was a Roman Catholic who converted to my mother's religion, the Russian Orthodox faith, when my little brother was dying, 
and the local priest demanded money to pray for him. Although the music of the Russian church was to me more beautiful than any choral music I had ever heard, I revolted against religion at an early age, feeling there must be something more. So I studied the philosophy of Rudolf Steiner, including his biodynamic practices, and shortly thereafter met a pandit and began the study of Raja Yoga. At the same time, I was preparing for an operatic career for the Metropolitan Opera on a scholarship from one of the leading mezzo-sopranos of the day, Regina Resnick, and I began taking voice lessons with her teacher. At Hunter College, I met the writer and philosopher René Philip Muller, who befriended me, and through him, Dimitri von Morenschild, who was to become a lifelong friend. To quickly conclude this introduction, I was offered a scholarship to Shantiniketan by the pundit I had been studying with since my late teens. I worked two jobs to earn enough to come to India, and I followed him to California. I waited week after week, and he kept delaying. And finally, as my funds were dwindling, after working 16 and 18 hours a day, he said, everything has fallen through. If you truly want to do yoga, go home to your family and practice samatha, equality. And I looked him in the eye and I said, no, I am going to India. And almost as if by miracle, within a day or two, I met Jyoti Priya, whose name was given to her by Sri Aurobindo, when at a very young age she traveled alone to India to find the secret of the Veda. She told me of this extraordinary journey. She had been a theosophist. Her whole family was in the Theosophical Society in California. And she went to Benares to find the secret of the Veda. And in a few days, a man came to her and gave her a typewritten manuscript and it was Sri Aurobindo's secret of the Veda, long before it was printed. And she said, I have nowhere else to go. I need not seek anything else. And she came immediately to the ashram, and Sri Aurobindo gave her her name, Jyoti Priya. Her name was Dr. Judith Tyberg. She was a professor of Sanskrit. And when I met her at the East-West Cultural Center, it was one of the focal points of the mother and Sri Aurobindo's work in America, I saw the photos of mother and Sri Aurobindo for the first time. When I was 19, perhaps, I, I heard in this pundit's group a man who said, oh yes, I know Aurobindo. He's that man who can say things in 20 words when he could have used one. I was 22 years old, and Jyoti Priya said, you must contact mother. So in those days, one had to send a photograph and a sample of one's handwriting, not just a photo. Mother's reply came back very quickly uh, by telegram. Tell him he may come and stay as long as he likes. Oh, can you imagine that for a young man? So I boarded, boarded sorry, a Japanese freighter bound for Japan with a blessing packet from the mother. And we ran into a typhoon. The deck was loaded with redwood logs, two to three hundred feet long, and I watched them break off like toothpicks. 
in the sea, and nothing was left on the deck. The captain said, if we go one more degree, we will capsize. Knowing nothing, I still knew that mother would not allow this ship to go down. And the seas calmed, and they all prayed on their knees, and we made it through to Japan. Then, because it's not easy to get to mother, we had two weeks in Tokyo and then Kyoto, where waiting for another ship to come. I visited the gardens that mother had seen and I went to one garden that was so magnificent and I met a monk who took us around to each building and he said in the most perfect English I have ever heard he told us the entire story of how each building had been prepared so I asked him if I could come back the next morning and just ask him a couple of questions. I had seen a tree just outside, a huge pine tree, maybe 90 feet tall, and it was wrapped in straw to about half of its height. And I wanted to know about this. So I came back at eight o'clock sharp. I knocked on the door and as I knocked it opened and he was there. Come in, come in. And I said, well, sir, I'm so very happy to... Slow, no English, no English. I said, but you... He had memorized from an Englishman each plaque that was on each building. And he had, me and he had since that fellow had perfect diction, he also had perfect diction. So, so I had to go very slowly and I said, Tell me about the tree. He said, tree sick. Give medicine. 200 years more, okay. <laughs> so, I got on the ship and it was delayed one hour and then another hour. And I said, when am I going to get to mother? Suddenly my name is called. And I'm down in the hold, hot and smelly. I had not filled out the proper exit permit and they were going to deport me from the ship. So there were fr some French sailors and they said, we can stow you away. So they got ready to stow me away, and then I had this feeling from mother, no, you must stay in Japan. And I stayed for another few weeks, and I had an experience that was so beautiful. As I was singing for people, they asked me to come to a children's orchestra and to sing for them. And see, this was all the grace, all the divine grace. And I went there and every child was blind. And they had formed an orchestra of blind children. And they played for me and I sang for them. Then I got a flight. I was helped and I made my way from Madras to Pondicherry, after many, many adventures in the South China Sea, and the bus from Madras to Pandi cost me three rupees, and I had about 10 rupees left. Dayabai took me in at Park Guest House. I arrived on November 23rd, 1961, and I, was, I had turned 23. On the morning of November 24th, I had my first darshan of mother. 
See, the balcony was so close, the old balcony on what we call Balcony Road now. And I have seen in the exhibition where people felt that uh, Mother looked at each one. There's no question about it. Each of us knew the moment she looked on us. In fact, one time, she looked at me, and her eyes turned into diamonds. And the diamonds hit me right here, and I fell back three feet. So I told my friend Marilyn about these spinning diamonds that bore through my heart. And she said, oh, that's not such an interesting experience. She said, Janina has made a painting of it in the ashram. Go and see. And I went to the library and I had the experience again because there it was in the painting. Mother's eyes absolutely were spinning in that painting. And so I guess many people had that experience. But for me, it was very special. When mother saw that I was having a difficult time with the food, she sent me a large brick of cheddar cheese. The cheese was wonderful, but what she put into it. And the fact that she thought of me. Each time I went to see mother, I had the same experience of entering a room without walls. Another friend of mine, Bob Zwicker in the archives, also has had this experience. I recall that it was a very large room and one had to walk some distance to reach mother's feet. But now I see that it's a tiny little room and not even a step and a half you could be there. My first meeting with mother lasted about an hour. And when you go to Sri Aurobindo's room and you're coming out and you see where they sat together for, to give darshan and then you turn and go to go out, there is a chair there. And that is where we had our interviews with mother. And today, no one stops me when I put my head on her footstool. Mother spoke to me for some time about music and she asked me, is the music with you now? And I said, yes, mother, it is always with me. And it was recurring music that came all the time. Mother looked at me and smiled and she said, not always. And then she took it away for many years to work on other aspects. And so, for a long time, the music went into the background, although I kept listening. And Mother spoke to me further about Chopin, which was very interesting. She said, Chopin's music is that most often heard on the subtle planes. And she said, but I don't know why. Then she said, you must bring down a new music. And at the time, of course, I was studying opera and mo more than opera, concert, leader, and art song. And so poetry and music was very much, were very much intertwined. So I said, but mother, I don't know anything about combining words and music. And Mother said, No, no, you must go far above words and bring down the pure music. And so, after more than 40 years of listening to thousands and thousands of works of music, seeking the new music, singing not often but having given up all thought of a concert career two years ago i had an experience that the new music was to descend in a collective body one body 
in aspiration. And so I began, by her grace, the Om choirs in the ashram and Oroville. There's so much I could say about the Om choirs, but uh, Sergei and Fabrice have recorded me last week, so eventually you'll hear about that because I have much more to tell you about experiences with mother. And I go back to the ashram then, my first days. I became an ashramite. Mother put me on prosperity. And I was a pretty wild fellow. And Mother knew this, of course. So one day, at six in the morning, the young man comes to me and he says, Nolini would like to see you. So I went to Nolini, and he said the most extraordinary thing to me. He said, Mother wants you to know that she gives you complete freedom in the ashram. But with that comes total responsibility. So at the time, because my vital was a little too active, I was going back in 1962, and I wrote some notes and questions to mother, and she wrote underneath her answers. So I would say, I would write, to Divine Mother from Narad, and she would cross out to and from, and she would put from Divine Mother to Narad. <laughs> <laughs> So my parents, of course, were devastated. I was almost disowned. Virtually, I was disowned because leaving the church was a terrible thing to, to do. And mother wrote, quote, will they not understand if you tell them simply that you have a way of your own? So the next question was about my future work because mother had totally upended me. I didn't know where to go, what to do. This force that she had put in me, I couldn't go back to, I don't know, that world. So I asked her, what should I do? Should I carry on with it? Training my voice or should I form a choir? And mother wrote, quote, one or the other, because the most important thing is not so much what you choose, but the spirit in which you will do it. Keep living in you the spirit of consecration, and all will be all right. Mother told me to marry. Quote, you must marry, no doubt and no hesitation. Then there was this wonderful young man, extremely handsome young man, who invited me to go all through Europe with him. And of course, to meet many beautiful young ladies. His name was Ivan. Mother wrote simply, Better not. <laughs> and you know, when I met her, she went through each question in detail again without referring to anything. And she had thousands and thousands of people prior to that time in just the order I had written in my letter. And the interesting thing was, at the end, she told me about this man, wonderful fellow. She said, it is better not to be with people 
who live outside of themselves, as it were. And before I returned to the United States, Mother wrote me this beautiful letter. Go on boldly, following your way with joy and confidence, taking great care of one thing only, never to forget the divine. When I returned to the U.S., I worked at different jobs to put food on the table. I married Annie and did whatever I could for mother's work. I took up the work of the handmade watercolor paper, which I asked mother to name, and she gave it the name Arvind. I made contacts with the most well-known watercolor artists in the U.S. and sent them samples of the paper and they were all ecstatic about it and wrote glowing assessments. But although the samples were fine, the quality control was lacking. The first ream of paper that arrived it was ruined by seawater because it wasn't properly packed. And the interesting thing at this point was that the handmade paper from England the Whatman papers had just gone out of business because of labor costs. And there was only one Italian paper, and the ashram had a chance to make millions of dollars. So I apologized profusely to this company and said, uh, we'll send another ream, and it will be fine. A second ream came with all black spots in the paper. The rag wasn't properly cleaned. This was 100% rag, handmade watercolor paper. So I met a man from Long Island who was an expert in making handmade rag paper. He told me if I would get a ticket for him to go to the ashram, he would share his expertise and teach the people how to make handmade paper properly. I wrote to mother, and then this beautiful card she sent me, she wrote, this is all a dream in the air and cannot be realized. So I had to leave it and then she said, if they cannot do the work properly, then it has to be left. And so it was left. She would send me birthday cards every year, write on them with her love and blessings. But one year, she wrote, she put Sri Aurobindo's quote on there, and, she, and it has been the source of so much of my aspiration. Quote, it is by a constant inner growth that one can find a constant newness and unfailing interest in life. In the mid-1960s, I was working at various jobs and at one point got a position in a record store. In those days, it was long playing vinyl records. So I thought I would write Mother and I wrote her a two-page letter to ask her what composers she had heard. And I, would, and I put a list together of the chron a chronological list of composers since the time of Debussy and Ravel. Mother wrote me a beautiful letter, which unfortunately has been lost, possibly destroyed at my parents' home, in which she said she would be very happy to listen to all of the records I would send her. She underlined the last composers she had heard, Ravel and Debussy, and wrote that, wrote, I have probably heard everything they have written. But from that time forward, she had not heard any of the composers I had listed. So with the help of a musicologist, 
who was the manager of the record store, I put together a box of 50 long playing records with all the great composers from that point on. I included electronic group music and even The Doors, the rock and roll group. And mother listened every afternoon for one hour until she had heard everything. Well, then in the mid-1960s, I had an accident in a blizzard on an icy hill. Two elderly ladies had stalled their car perpendicular to traffic, and there was no way to stop the car, and crashed into them. And he went into the windshield and had to have numerous stitches, but mother said there would be no scars, and there were no scars. Finally, you know, in those days, uh, one recovered very little. Mil today it's millions and millions of dollars if you burn your tongue on a cup of coffee at McDonald's. But we recovered $3,000 for medical expenses. I immediately wrote to mother and offered to send her the money. And she wrote back, why don't you use the money to come for the inauguration of Oroville? It was $1,500 a ticket, exactly. So there was the $3,000. And mother gave me permission to photograph the entire ceremony of the inauguration of all the young people putting soil in the urn. And these have become part of Oroville's archives. I went to mother many times during that period. Uh, the first meeting was with the man from Los Angeles, and he and myself. This gentleman, Isidore, was not for this life. And mother looked at him and smiled, and then turned to Ani, and she said, This is not the first time we have met. You have been with me many times before, many, many times. Imagine that. Then she turned to me and said, You don't want to come to Oroville in a few years? I feel you can do something there. And I said, Yes, Mother, whatever is your will. So we returned in March 1968, when I began a period of... Uh, I, I actually was working as a manager of a restaurant, and I became... Uh, a partner in another restaurant, very successful, making a lot of money. And then a day came when I began to hear this voice. The voice was saying constantly, go to California and help Jyoti Priya. So I wrote to mother. No answer. One month goes by, no answer. I said, surely, mother, there has to be something because the voice wasn't stopping. So I wrote to mother again, and mother sends me a telegram. Quote, my answer to you was so positive that I thought I had written it. <laughs> so I left immediately for California to work with Jyoti Priya. But it was not to be a few years because Udar wrote just after that, saying, Mother has asked me to write you and tell you that she wants you to prepare to come and build the gardens of the Matrimandir. I wrote back asking Mother if she wanted me to pursue formal studies or practical work in the field. And mother said, a combination of both would be best. So I worked during the day and I went to college at night, studied plant combination theory and other aspects of horticulture while working with Jyoti Priya as well. Now, 
I should tell you that almost all of my life has been working with plants and flowers. Since the age of 11, I was cutting grass at, at a firehouse or at a petrol station and not knowing much about plants, my father was in electronics and decided he would become a landscaper and work with another one person. And so, you see, now I can look back some 50 years later and see that this was all worked out by the divine grace. So, I began to collect seeds and with all the young people in the East-West Cultural Center, we would go out on weekends and go into all the parks and public gardens and collect seeds for, to plant at the Matrimandir. Now, my experience with plants had been in temperate climate plants. But the move to California to work with Jyoti Priya gave me the opportunity to know subtropical species, preparing me for the tropical species. So again, Mother had worked everything out. So I had three years to prepare. I thought I had three years to prepare. And in nine months, Mother writes me, A biento. See you soon. So then I had to go right away. And uh, came in December 1969. And we went up to Mother. It was on Annie's birthday, December 18th. And it was at this time that Mother spoke to me of the gardens. And her voice was so strong, so clear. She said, It must be a thing of great beauty, of such a beauty, that when men enter, they will say, Ah, this is it. And they will experience physically and concretely the significance of each garden. In the garden of youth, they will know youth. In the garden of bliss, they will know bliss. And then she raised her hand and she said, One must know how to move from consciousness to consciousness. And she said then, it must manifest something of that which we are trying to bring down. Mother said, you will make some sketches and show them to me and we will see together. And then she said, I would like you to begin with the Garden of Unity. Now, when it comes to art, I have only left thumbs. I have absolutely no capacity as an artist or an architect. I am virtually hopeless. And I worked with Pierre Legrand on certain sketches, but nothing came. And for years, nothing came. I was 31 years old. And one night, I, I had a dream. This was in 1970. And I saw our house. And Mother said it was to be the first house built in Oroville at the place called Peace at the center. Of course, it was never done, as so many things were never done, but that's all right. I dreamt of this house, a beautiful house. It was round, and people were sitting all around on a beautiful white carpet. And there was one light coming from the center 
into the middle of the house. Of course, Matrimandir hadn't started, but now I know that the Matrimandir is our house. And she gave me the blessing to see it. Now, Ani had a dream shortly after that, and she wrote to mother. I was going up into the sky because I saw a golden tree. And I said, I must bring that down to earth and plant it for mother. So Ani wrote the whole dream out, and mother replied, she, mother wrote on the letter, it is not quite a dream, and it is a very good indication about the work you are doing. So then mother gave me the work of reading Savitri every week under the banyan, and then at the center, where we all stayed in the area called Peace, where I read Savitri for 10 years. When, I, when the excavation for the Matramandia was to begin, I wrote to Mother asking if it would not be better if Aurevillians did the work of building the Matramandia. And she replied that it would be better if Aurevillians did all the work. I found a good location for the Matrimandia Gardens nursery with a large canyon at the back and a lower road on the south area and the possibility of some protection from the herds of goats that would wipe out months of work in a few hours. And mother gave her blessings for the site. So the early 70s through the mid 70s were a time of difficulty in Oroville. Very little food sometimes, almost no amenities. And there was an aspect of superiority, I guess you would say, from some of the workers on the construction looking down on the people who were doing flowers. So Mary Helen wrote to Mother, and Mother replied that the gardens were as important as the Matrimandir itself. Now, just briefly, I'll tell you what has come to me about the gardens. I spoke to 50 people this morning. You see the, the golden chain people come out. They have been coming out every Sunday for the few months that I've been here. And they come out every other Sunday normally. And we have worked so harmoniously together. And in the moment we're together, there's this joy that fills everyone with the beauty of the work and, and the devotion that they bring to it. And now Aurevillians are beginning to join the work. So this is what I have experienced about the gardens. You see, they begin in a counterclockwise direction with existence. Existence is first. Consciousness following existence and bliss. Satchidananda. Satchidananda manifested on the earth. Now, as a result of Satchidananda, there is light. With light comes life. So, existence, consciousness, bliss, light, life. From life naturally evolves power. Existence, consciousness, bliss, life, light, power. Power brings wealth. Wealth utilized properly, usefulness, brings progress. And that's the ninth garden. And progress leads to the last three gardens, youth, an eternal youth, harmony, an indivisible harmony, and the last garden, perfection, the perfect perfection, 
which leads to Satchidananda. More than 60 flower significances were named by mother from the Matrimandya Gardens Nursery. All the hibiscus with Oroville names, with the exception of one, were grown here. And mother would express great delight when they were brought to her. I could hear her downstairs saying things like Magnif magnifique and, and she was, these hibiscus of course were the Hawaiian hibiscus, huge flowers which she has named, interestingly, at first, Charm of Oroville, Sweetness of Oroville. And then later she said, well, we have to give them a wider significance for the rest of the world. So we'll call them Charm of the New Creation. And Oroville is the new creation. So they bear a dual name. Beauty of the new creation, blossoming of the new creation, charm of the new creation, concentration of the new creation, firmness of the new creation, ideal of the new creation, manifold power of the new creation, progress of the new creation, usefulness of the new creation. Among the wonderful names that Mother gave that reverberate in my consciousness, and will reverberate forever. Named from Oroville in the Matrimonial Gardens Nursery, just to name a few, Remembrance of Sri Aurobindo, Opening to Sri Aurobindo's Force, To Live Only for the Divine, and Joy of Union with the Divine. I worked with Richard Pearson to update the botanical information for the first revision of the flower book. And then with Mary Helen, who did many of the line drawings, and Mary Aldrich on the plant descriptions, grammar, etc. During this time, we had the great blessing of asking Mother numerous questions on flowers and plants, and these form the basis of the current and previous books. For example, I wrote Mother asking what effect the supermental would have on flowers. And Mother replied that flowers would be among the first to respond to the supermental, as their entire life is an aspiration for light. I also wrote. Uh, and asked her, if our flowering, flower offering depends on our state of consciousness, does it help to learn the significance of flowers, even if it is purely mental to begin with? Mother wrote back, yes, surely. Then we had this cyclone in 1972. And the huge branch of the service tree was broken off. And you have read what Mother has said about our consciousness being responsible for that. And I saw the young men beginning to cut the branch, and it would have torn the whole tree down. And since I had worked for so many years with my father pruning trees, I asked if I could help. And I knew Parichand very well. He was my elder brother, and he said, yes, go up. And so I saw, showed them how to cut it, and we worked for the whole day. And at the end, that huge stub came off perfectly well, and you can see today that it has healed completely. When I completed that, Parichan came to me, and he said, Mother has sent you this blessings packet to care for the service tree for the rest of your life. On my birthday in 1972, I went up to mother's room. Well, first let me tell you that all through the 70s, 
I had bouts of amoebic dysentery. And I was in the nursing home so many times. And Dilipdata would look after me. And at one point, I was so ill that I wrote that I just felt that I should leave the body. So I wrote to mother and I said, Mother, what should I do? Should I take this medicine, which was horrible medicine called flagell? Should I take the medicine or should I just put myself in your hands and let happen what happens and just pray to you? Mother wrote back, take the medicine and pray to me. <laughs> so I recovered. On my birthday in 1972, I went up to her room and she greeted me with this vast smile and powerful and joyous bon fête. And after she handed me my card, she gave me my card, I placed my head on her feet. And knowing only a little because of the notes on the way, I didn't want to take too much of her time because I knew that she was working on the cells of the body. And so many people were going to her. And, and so I got up and she looked at me and she said, Look at your card. And I opened my card, and there was the old name, Richard, and the new name, Narad. And then I broke down in tears, and I don't know how long I stayed on her feet. So I shall close these remembrances with a few anecdotes. One time, on Darshan Day, one of the Darshan days, the rain was pouring down on all of us, absolutely drenching people. And so naturally they put umbrellas up all over and mother came out. And then she went back in and Udar told me this story. And she said, you see Udar, I send down the grace and they put their umbrellas up to stop it. So Udar said, I will never have an umbrella again. And Gauri, his daughter, told me, yes. So then he trudged into mother's rooms, over her carpets and over the floors, pouring water. And so we said to him one day, maybe you could wear a raincoat and just keep your head bare. And, <laughs> and so he did that from then on. Now. In 1980, on my birthday, I went to Nolini, who had been my inner guide for a long time. He would come to me in the, in the night and teach me I don't know what, because with this sieve for a head, I couldn't. I couldn't understand those things, even if I tried with the mind. And when I approached him once after two weeks of intense teaching, I said, you know, you're coming every night. How about it? Maybe it's your own soul. And he just made light of it and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't say anything. So then we presented him with 100 different flowers of psychological perfection. Colors, sizes, fragrances, huge platter. And uh, he took them and gave them to Anima and said, be sure to give back the platter. And, oh, I have to tell you this funny story. It was in, uh, it was about 1978 and I was exhausted. And I went into Nolini and I said, Nolini, I need my batteries recharged. And he 
stood like that and he put his hands on my head for two minutes and then he said, they are recharged. And I could have floated out of that room. And of course, Ani was, was there remembering my old name. And so she said, recharged, 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 recharged. So, so back to my birthday. I had written him a long letter about the difficulties in Oroville. And why did we have to go through those difficulties? And very quietly and very deeply, he said, it need not be that way. You see, she is trying a thousand ways. And then he turned to Mary Helen. And he said, your body. And then he turned to me and said, and your body. And then he pointed to himself. And he said, and my body. We think they are different bodies. They are not. They are all her body. She has put a part of herself into each of us. She is the force the inevitable word, the magnet of our difficult ascent. All nature dumbly calls to her alone to heal with her feet the aching throb of life and break the seals on the dim soul of man and kindle her fire in the closed heart of things. This is the knot that ties together the stars. The two who are one are the secret of all power. The two who are one are the might and right in things. His soul, silent, supports the world and her. His acts are her commandments registers. Happy, inert, he lies beneath her feet. His breast he offers for her cosmic dance, of which our lives are the quivering theater. And none could bear but for his strength within Yet none would leave because of his delight.